Ever since the beginning of the Future Trends Forum, nearly seven years ago, we've been looking at the economics of higher education. We've been looking at how higher education is financed, how higher education intersects with macroeconomic trends like inequality, but above all, we've been looking at jobs. What does it mean for a college or university to prepare a student for the marketplace? How is the labor marketplace changing? What is higher education doing well? And what do we need to do a lot better? I'm so absolutely delighted to be able to welcome whom I think of as the world's great expert on this subject. Uh, Tony Carnavalli is the director of the Center for um, on Education and the Workforce at Georgetown University. He has a startlingly impressive resume. He publishes a tremendous amount of cutting edge research which influences policymakers and uh, thought leaders around the world. I can't praise this man all, enough. All I can do is bring him on stage so that we can all meet him. Welcome, Hello. Tony. So you've been talking to my mom. <laughs> well, um, she'd be welcome, but I'm especially glad to see you. <laughs> Where have we found you today? Are you in uh, the D.C. area right now? I'm in D.C., uh, not on the campus. I figured out uh, a couple of years ago that working off campus saves money. <laughs> so... Uh, one of the things that universities are learning is that people like me will figure that out. <laughs> but uh, I'm we're, I'm off campus, as is my are all my colleagues at the center. Understood. Um, very good. Well, I'm not too far from you. I'm from um, coming to you from Manassas, northeastern Virginia. Um, so, uh, COVID permitting, someday we'll have to meet each other for coffee. Yes. Um, I, I mentioned to you, Tony, before that. Um, we have people introduce themselves in an unusual way, but an appropriate way on the Future Transform. We ask you about what you're going to be working on for the upcoming year. I mean, that is, what are the ideas that are going to be the top of your mind? What are the projects and tasks that are going to be taking up most of your time for the next year? Well, I kind of know, and that answer stems from the fact that the center pretty much reserves 30 to 40 percent of our time uh, for issues that come up over the transom oh. uh, is, is one way to put it. That is, we're fairly open to uh, questions from policymakers, media, practitioners, and so on. So there's a fair amount of that. And then uh, when an issue comes up, we are often encouraged or decide ourselves to do work on that issue. So uh, race-based affirmative action is the obvious one at the moment, frankly, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. where we're, in which we're, we're striving uh, to get something out fairly soon on that. And then there are the usual, uh, for us, there are uh, products that we produce on a regular basis. Once every three to four years, we do projections and we're doing that this year out to 2031. Uh, oh. And then we do good jobs projections. We decide uh, which of the jobs that are going to be produced are good jobs using a standard we created with a group of economists. Uh, and uh, so uh, we're doing uh, work that people would expect a lot of, or some of what we're doing is that because essentially we're part of um, what is, I think, in the history of higher education, a major event, uh -huh. uh, which is that uh, the purpose of higher education is clearly to allow people to live more fully in their time. Uh, but what has changed in that long term mission is the relationship between higher education and the economy. So that we're now living in a world where um, the most traveled pathway to the middle class is through higher education. Uh, so that our work tends to focus there, and we'll probably increasingly focus there. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, thank you. I I, I admire the uh, the uh, practical smartness of having a third of your time available for things that develop uh, over the course of the year, uh, and things are moving very very quickly indeed. So there's uh, quite a bit, and everything you've said so far is these are all reasons that so many of us benefit from the CWs. Um, friends, uh, I have on the bottom left of the screen a link to a recent set of publications from uh, the, from uh, Tony's center. Uh, you can see it on the header, The Uncertain Pathway from Youth to a Good Job. 
And that actually points you to a bunch of research, uh, which looks at a whole bunch of different factors. I'm going to start off by asking Tony a couple of questions um, to get everything rolling. But this forum is here for all of you. So as he and I speak, please start thinking about your questions, uh, your examples, your comments, your ideas. Um, and again, just use the buttons at the bottom of the screen in order to put them forward. I, I guess the, the first question I had for you that I'd like to ask is kind of the most popular question, which is how is higher education not doing a good job in preparing, especially young students for the workforce? How are we falling down on that job? I mean, almost by definition, higher education is doing a good job in the sense that um, most of the access to good jobs is created by some form of post-secondary education in America now. Uh -huh. The exception to that is that about 30% of good jobs end up being jobs for high school graduates, but only 20% of those jobs end up being good jobs, whereas a much higher share of jobs that are attached to post-secondary education and or training, oftentimes both, uh, those are where the good jobs are and higher education performs that function. Now, it does that in a extremely powerful way, um, but as it does so, it in any economic shift, you tend to reinforce the underlying sociology in a society. Uh -huh. um, so what we know about higher education since the 80s and especially since the 90s uh, is that higher education, if you want to pick one institution, um, higher education is probably the most powerful institution in American life now, higher education and training. It's the most powerful institution in American life determining uh, whether people make it or not, and that is reflected in a reinforcement, especially since the 90s, of the underlying race, class, and gender inequality in America. So higher education is making things more unequal, not less so. It almost can't help do that uh, unless it uh, specifically attempts not to do that, and for a variety of reasons, uh, it's fairly limited in its, in its uh, uh, ability to buck sociology in America. Wow. So on the one hand, we, we are a powerful gateway. We are, in a sense, a major production or production force for the middle class in America. But at the same time, we're also reproducing and accentuating the inequalities that are with that riddle the society within which we're embedded. Um, I... I was going to follow up with another question, Tony, but questions have just popped up all over the place. So let me just share these uh, because I, I, I want to make sure people get a chance to ask them. Uh, John Hollenbeck asks a quick question. This is a good definitional question. Uh, what's the definition you're working from for a good job? We, not we, the Gates Foundation gave us money and we convened a group of economists, labor economists, uh, mostly the ones that we would worry about it if we did it on our own, to try to figure out what a good job is. Uh, I suppose, predictably, we could only agree on two things <clears throat> after months and months of conversation. <clears throat> and that is that the wage defines a good job. Hmm. That was the de minimis mm -hmm. employment and a wage, employment mm -hmm. and earnings. And mm -hmm. what we came up with that everybody agreed to and disagreed on everything else uh, was that, and the numbers have changed literally because of the current inflation, but the mm -hmm. numbers as, as of several months ago uh, was that if you, when you boil it down, it's a complicated uh, analysis, but when you boil it down, what it says is if you can make a minimum of $45,000 a year before you're in your 40s, mm -hmm. uh, you've got a good job. Uh, we don't do benefits. We're criticized a lot for that, but uh, uh -huh. and we're thinking about changing that. But it gets incredibly complicated. Anyway, the uh, so that's our definition. It's basically about employment earnings. Well, that's a very clear definition, and I appreciate the Sisyphean task of trying to get a bunch of economists to agree on something. I, well, we um, got them all to sign off. That was the real goal all along. 
<laughs> well, it came down to two numbers. And, and you got it. Um, well, thank you, John, for the question. And, and thank you, Tony, for the uh, clear answer. Uh, we have uh, other questions that have come up. Uh, one is from uh, Kiel Doomsch, a uh, great uh, um, uh, fan of the forum. And he asks, uh, or he thinks alternative credentialing will make college affordable. I wonder what Dr. Carnavalli's view is on alternative credentialing. What we know when we're going through a period in which what I think of as alternative credentialing, which is training, work experience, and so on, that has become very popular in the last few years, uh, popular with legislators. So that means it's going to be part of, it'll be an increasing share of our higher education system. That is, training is growing. Um, and support for work-based learning and so on. So uh, there is, uh, that's the closest thing we've got to an alternative credentialing system. It, it includes certificates, certifications. There are all sorts of uh, badges. Um, uh, the whole notion of using work experience as credit uh, and so on. So the alternative uh, certification is becoming more about training than degree level education, although it's very hard to separate the two. I mean, that's the mm -hmm. uh, but it's clear that going forward, uh, there's a lot of uh, political support for training as an alternative to degrees or as an accompaniment to degrees. Well, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. That's a very clear answer, Keel. Thank you for that question. Uh, and friends, if you're new to the forum, that's an example of a text question. I'm going to give you another one right now. Uh, this is from uh, Anne Fenzi at University of Maine, where she's a PhD candidate. Uh, and she asks, you describe three of the challenges that young people face in getting good jobs in your report. How are the challenges different for adults who need post-secondary credentials to get a good job? And I suppose you, you probably want to mention what those three big challenges are that Anne has in mind. Uh Greetings to you. I'm from Hodgson, probably north of you. Uh, there is a um, the the challenges that are uppermost uh, at the moment um, are the I think in the end the challenge uh, that is uppermost is the the is our ability to integrate uh, general and specific education in the United States. That is to make it. Simple, the humanities and specific uh, majors attached to occupations or industries, which is about 70% of BA degrees, by the way, and much more than that of graduate degrees and so on. So the, uh, that integration uh, is crucial. We know how it works because of a lot of good basic research, uh, and that is that uh, both general education, let's call it the humanities, uh, and specific education uh, in particular fields of study, that they both have power unto themselves in determining earnings. Uh, we also know that they substitute for each other. So I can get a certificate in heating, ventilation, and air conditioning and out earn a whole lot of BAs and even a lot of graduate degrees. Uh -huh. um, on the other hand, I can get a very strong um, bachelor's degree in the humanities. And although uh, I will certainly, well, almost certainly, uh, begin at a much lower employment earnings prospect, uh, over time, I, my, my earnings will gain because there's an interaction always between general and specific. So what you really want if you're trying to grab the brass ring is you want the richest mix of general and specific, and those are the big winners in the game. That sounds like a call for a very careful core curriculum overhaul. Yeah, a lot of places, including, I mean, George, we're doing this at Georgetown, always have, I guess, although it seems more intense now. It's more intense everywhere, I think. Uh, and that is a lot of the people in the counseling operation here, although they don't do what they don't do labor market counseling, but in the educational counseling operation, you're trying to figure out how you integrate those two kinds of education. Well, that's a lot of work. Um, and thank you. Uh, thank you for that great question. And good luck uh, on your PhD. Uh, and Tony, I'm going to bring up a question from a, a young gentleman that we both have the good fortune to know, 
uh, which is uh, Jordan Davis, who is a, a student and a brilliant young man at, uh, at Georgetown University. And he asks, what other countries around the world do you believe exemplify both a strong economy and a strong higher education infrastructure? I would say that the United States, and here I'm on touchy ground, I'm not an expert on this, but in my, you know, my free trips to Europe to sit on panels, I've learned that um, the United States and say and, and nations like France, uh, we're very good at elite education. That as our system is profoundly elitist uh, and basically sorts the population for us. Um, other nations, and the, it's the usual example, it's Germany, the, the hot one now is Switzerland. Uh, they are much, much better at providing education, which tends to be more occupationally specific for non-college people. But in the end, of course, that means that they track people from a very early age on. And in a diverse country like the United States, especially since the 1983 Nation at Risk report and all the K-12 education reform that followed that, we have banned tracking, so to speak, uh, so that, uh, but there's still an issue. We're graduating people from high school. We say they're college and career ready. They're more college ready than they used to be, although the dropout rate is huge. Uh, and they're certainly not career ready. There's nothing in Algebra 2 that's going to get you a job. Uh so maybe uh, this is something where the U.S., we can be proud of the U.S., uh, if not complacent. Um, and uh, Jordan, good yeah, The other thing that's worth saying, because it doesn't get said enough, because it's kind of an academic finding, but it's a consistent finding, is that the American model, which distinguishes itself sort of because the B.A. and the two-year degree um, uh, tries to amplify the same characteristic, which is you mix general and specific education. It turns out, and I think this is accidental, but it turns out that when you look at the economic effects of mixing general and specific, it both creates higher earnings and higher levels of technology change and adaptability mm -hmm. in our economy versus the European. So arguably, mm -hmm. uh, the American degree, especially the BA degree, is the uh, best thing going in the Western world. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the extra dive into that question. Uh, and, and we have still more questions coming in. Um, this is great. Uh, you've just lit, the, uh, lit our group on fire, uh, Tony. Um, we have uh, a question that has come in from uh, our longtime supporter, Don Shawless. He couldn't be here today, um, so he asked me to ask this for him, which is, what do you foresee as the educated underclass continues to grow and more working class people are disaffected. And Don here is referring to Gary Roth's uh, excellent book uh, on the subject of the educated underclass. We, as a nation, this is gonna sound a little harsh. Um, the United States has always been characterized in education, but in our economy before education became higher education became truly important in the 1980s. Um, but in our economy, we've always exhibited what I think you can only call brutal efficiency. That is, we only invest in people who have already been proven successful. They tend to be uh, the people who come from higher income families and white families. Uh, and so the brutal efficiency in the American system is because of our real estate structure. Uh, we have these two streams constantly and have for quite some time, especially since the 80s. Uh, but we have these two streams. Uh, the way we protect ourselves, those of us who succeed, is we don't live anywhere near those people who don't. So that uh, we sequester people in, geographically, literally. Uh, and we, the, the people who pay for less education are the less educated in terms of their earnings, their employment, crime rates, public services, on and on and on. That brutal efficiency is, some would argue, a lot of economists argue, they call it flexibility, uh, is at the core of the American competitive advantage. We 
produce very high value human capital in the cheapest way possible. That is, we don't waste money on people who we don't already know are going to make it. Hmm. Hmm. So that's the uh, the sorting mechanism. Uh, higher education as a as a as a sift of uh, pre-existing. Yeah, it talent. is a and you know. I think as Americans, and me included, I'm schizophrenic on this. That is, uh, I'm very happy, or I see it as a positive thing, that the economy, capitalism, values human capital much more than it used to. Now, that's a great achievement. It's the um, the continuation of the long arc and the growing value of human capital. That's mm-hmm. a good thing, especially mm-hmm. in a republic and a democracy. Mm-hmm. The equality question gets it, muddies it up considerably, but that's a good thing. But the bad news is that increasing power uh, is not equally distributed. And perhaps as uh, our national economy becomes more and more unequal, um, that higher education plays a stronger role in widening those gaps well there are when you look towards the future um so we do here. it looks like those gaps will widen that is i don't know of any trend that says they won't that is when you're talking about higher education yeah. um, when you're talking about training jobs that's different uh, the infrastructure bill makes that different so the um in the end looking forward the other thing is that our demography if you take um, the increase in earnings inequality since 1983, which is when uh-huh. it started to increase after the 81 recession, uh-huh. uh, more than 70% of that increase can be attributed to differences in access to post-secondary education and training with labor oh. market benefit. So wow. higher education is performing um, very efficiently uh and doing that particular job and when you look forward the most worrisome thing i think in the context of other worrisome things is the demography which is to say we're getting more and more families with two bachelor's degrees at the head of the household Uh so if you're georgetown where i work uh, enrollments are doubling every year Uh, that is applications are doubling every year um more and more rich kids out there uh very smart rich kids Uh, and then uh the demography however in general that is the college age population is going down especially after 2025 it'll go down most in new england and the Uh the east uh Uh it won't go down so much in the south and the west but more and more of the population will be from families that don't have parents with higher education at the head of the household. So, um, and they're people who can afford higher ed on their own, least of all, and so on and so on. They're more loan averse and so on and so on. So the division is going to increase because if you are a private, for instance, if you're a private college, uh, and there are a lot of Jesuit colleges like this, so I hear about this a fair amount. Um, If you're a private, a little private college somewhere and you're not that selective, if you do, uh, teach people who could use their, your help um, a lot. Um, if you're not selective, you can't sell that, uh, and that, which is status and higher spending and higher graduation rates and some other things. Um, but at the same time, uh, you're then uh, in a situation where if you're anywhere near selective, it's either climb or die because the population, your population is going down and -hmm. your success rates are gonna go down. Um, And so in the end, uh, that division in the United States by itself, unless things are done about it, uh, by itself will grow naturally through demography. So we are already skewed towards the elite and we will become even more so. Um, That's. That's and a, don't, that's I mean, look what's happening in the Supreme Court. I mean, that is a complex issue, and it's a very unpopular sure. one. Uh, African Americans and Latinos don't like race-based affirmative action in the majority, for example. So, uh, but we've decided not to, or we're about to decide. I think it's fair to say uh, that we're about to decide that we're not going to make any special exceptions anymore. 
Some people believe that what will happen then, Rick Collenberg, who's a friend of mine, and I have a lot of respect for his work, he gets a lot of heat for it. Um, uh, he says, well, it'll be a good thing because we'll shift to class. Colleges will prove they're progressive by focusing on class. I don't believe it. No. Well, I, I would hope that we would be more more attuned to class, but you. you Why do that? You can't get money from poor kids. There we go. Or not so poor kids, because half of your enrollment, sort yeah. of ideally, depending on the college, the, the business model, but half of your um, enrollment is discount tuition to what are relatively advantaged yeah. kids. Yes. Oh, merit aid. It's not merit aid. It's a discount. So. <laughs> In the end, there are people who can almost afford it, but they can choose between you and three or four other places, and you're in a bidding war. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you uh, it just, just strikes me that the incentives to move on to move on class are just very, very weak. That makes sense. That is that's awful, but that makes sense. We we have we have more questions coming in. Uh, I invoked Gary Roth before, and he appeared. Uh, and he asked uh, a good follow-up question. I think, Tony, you've already spoken to this a bit, but if you want to say anything more uh, about it, is higher ed a pathway to the middle class or are the majority of college students already middle class by background, that is lateral mobility rather than upward mobility? There is uh, upward mobility due to post-secondary education and training uh, in the in the short term, I think it's going to increase, actually, in part because of infrastructure and some of the training bills. Uh, but yes, uh, when you're talking about the top 500 colleges, you're talking about essentially talking about educating the middle class. Once you go below that to the non-selectives and the two-year schools, it's a whole different game. And there, uh, the dropout rates are horrendous. So... I mean, one of the only ways out of this, and it's not a satisfying solution, I understand that, but uh, is to sort of embrace the problem and decide that we're going to get serious about what happens to people after they graduate. Huh. After they graduate. Yeah, it is a, uh, we know if you give me the name of any college, any college that gets Title IV funding from the federal government, it's just pretty much every college in the game. Mm -hmm. um, if you uh, give me that college, I know for every pro virtually for 80 percent of the programs in that college, what will I can tell you what will happen to you uh, when you graduate, because I know what happened to all the people who graduated in that program before you did. Now, of course, that can change. Doesn't very much. Uh, but uh, we know this. We're just not telling the students. Well, that's. Um... Thank you. That 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 is a useful thing to add to this. Uh, and by the way, Gary Roth is a is a fine writer, and we've had a session with him about six months ago on our uh, on our archives. So I please rec recommend that. Uh, we have more questions. And Tony, this is normally the point of the program where I encourage people to ask more questions. And now I don't have to because they're just all over the place. So I want to bring them up and give everybody a shot. Uh, this is from Ben Halland at Western Governors, who says, in the likely upcoming recession. What breaks first in the tension between bachelors as a common requirement for jobs and employers' needs for labor? It is a special moment in the relationship between education and the economy. Uh, there are some confusions that will reign for several years. Uh, to some extent, the shift to training away from the BA, let's say. Uh, the BA is getting a lot of bad press at the moment, which is not borne out by the data, by the way. But the, um, the support for training is sky high, most since the Carter administration on Capitol Hill and in the administration. It will be true for a Republican administration as well. So the, um, we know that uh, over the next, let me give you one example. On the infrastructure bill, uh, we don't know how many jobs it's going to create. It's gotten very confused. Uh, but in any event, we know it's going to create a lot of jobs for high school graduates uh, with no post-secondary, and they'll be good jobs. So we're going to get a bit of a shift. It won't be much, actually. It depends on what you believe. Some people believe infrastructure will create 7 million jobs for high school graduates. Other people believe it will be 800,000 because of inflation and a whole series of other factors. But the... 
um, we're in a moment in which the assault on the BA or whatever you want to call it, um, it is very, po if you're a journalist, uh, you're going to go, a local journalist, let's say, you're going to go to uh, politicians and anybody who's important is going to be on a stage somewhere for the next six years cutting ribbons. Uh, and in every one of those ribbon cuttings, a good reporter uh, will say, doesn't this mean people don't need a BA anymore? Politicians in both parties will say, yes, that's what it means. They're already doing it. It's what Joe Biden says. Pete Buttigieg says. Certainly the Republican Party says that. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So we're going through a bit of a false dawn. Uh, on alternatives to degrees. No, not to say that they aren't valuable, because many of them are and will continue to be seven, eight, nine, ten years out. But seven years out or so, when the infrastructure ending spending ends, we're going to have a retraining problem. Now, a lot of people, when you raise this in conversations with policymakers or politicians, uh -huh. uh, the answer you get, which is not stupid, I've done enough work in politics to understand this, uh, what they say is that's two, that's eight years is two presidential terms. Uh, that's four house terms. Uh, yes. Go to governor and the state legislature, same thing. Uh, this is yes. going to go on for a while because uh, you can go to those, you can vote for this stuff and you will be helping people. You will be creating good jobs. Just that there's a cliff out there. And that's a cliff we need to anticipate. Well, I, I, this is this feels like a moment for a station identification. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum, where we look at the future of higher education, cliffs and all. Uh, we have more questions coming in. Uh, one from Marty Tillman at the Gateway International Group. Uh, building off of what you were just saying, Marty asks, your research has always revealed the ROI of higher ed degree is a real benefit. But what? why do you think the popular culture now denigrates the degree? That's a good question because it does. Mm -hmm. uh, we just saw some polling, very recent, by I've forgotten the group, but a very good polling outfit that shows, and I may get this slightly wrong, that only 40%, it's less than 50, uh, think that higher education has an economic benefit. It's absolutely untrue. Uh, the, um, so in a lot of ways, my one of my biases, and it's a bias, is we want that to be true. That is, we all want opportunity for plumbers, electricians. We, we have traditionally not focused on that part of our economy. The new vogue for training will do that. That's part of what's going on there. And it is a good thing. We haven't focused on training since Jimmy Carter. So the, um, but uh, there is a tendency not to want uh, to go on to college, both parties, if you're a Democrat, you're trying to build the blue wall in the North. Uh, and that means you've got to get the white working class. You've already got the minority working class pretty much. If you're a Republican, you want to keep the white working class. Uh, so training is going to be very popular. And everybody is saying, um, you know, in training is truthfully an alternative. That's, that's part of all of these arguments is there's no nuance in the uh, yeah. These things are all sort of half true. It's very hard to communicate when things are, hard, are half true. Agreed. Agreed. Um, thank you. Uh, that's a really, really good answer. Uh, we have, uh, and thank you for that question, by the way. That's something we're, I think, going to be looking at for some time to come. Um, we have a question from our good friend George Station at Cal State Monterey Bay. Uh, and he asks this Can higher ed continue to fulfill its purpose? if a significant portion of its teaching workforce may not meet the definition of a good job. And here, George is referring to the adjunct professoria uh, called sessionals in Canada. Well, I'm going to reveal my biases here. I used to be the political and legislative director for AFSCME, the biggest public employee union in America, and maybe the biggest union in the AFL-CIO at the moment, I think. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, the answer there is that the public doesn't want to pay people. If you work in the public sector, your boss is somebody who probably makes less than you do. So there is a, and it is a first professional job, was in my family. Mm -hmm. uh, the, it is part of a pathway, an intergenerational pathway. So I don't know. I think that we're facing shortages again. 
they've been pretty persistent, but they look like they're going to get a lot worse on uh, K-12 teachers. The professoriate, we used to try to organize them. In fact, we used to try to organize Harvard every year. We were just being vengeful, truthfully. We were never going to organize them. But the, in the end, um, uh, higher education professors don't want to be organized. I can tell you that. I've run those campaigns. So uh, they're all little private businesses. Uh, and their loyalty is to their discipline. Uh -huh. So there is a, uh, they're very difficult to organize. If there's ever a moment for them to organize, it is now. <laughs> because the struggle in higher education is going to be largely focused on reorganizing the public systems. Private systems will go their own way. Uh -huh. They may get sort of attacked for uh, legacies and stuff like that. It's just a revenge uh -huh. politics. But in the end, um, uh, we're going to reorganize the public systems. And the way we're going to do that is now that we know how the system works at the program level, if you're a state legislator, you can reorganize your system at the program level. If you've got one legislator said to me years ago, and it's always stuck with me, we, and I don't know if these numbers are right now, so I won't say the state. We've got 20 places in this state where you can go and major in English. How come we don't just have 10? Uh -huh. And if you, and this was years ago, this guy said this, uh, uh -huh. and if you want to major in English, you go to one of those 10. If you don't want to major in English, you've got to take English to get your degree, take it online. I think that's where we're headed in the public systems. You can't reorganize the private system unless they learn, because the private system competes on the basis of the cafeteria model. You've got to have everything for everybody. If there's a new program in environmental insecticide or something, uh -huh. Uh -huh. you're going to get it because you're using it to attract students. So the privates all have to have the full cafeteria. So they have a very difficult time rationalizing their product and selling it in the way a market would generally demand. But once you know how the system works at the program level, you can start to organize it at the program level. And that is an efficiency move. Oh. The states are beginning to, some of them are doing it in ways that are not acceptable to a lot of people. Uh -huh. uh, and that is, you know, you don't do this by cutting out the French program. That's not the point. This is, uh, I think cutting out the programs ain't going to cut it. I mean, you're not going to get enough money doing that, first of all. But reorganizing is a different matter. And my own bias is you want to reorganize because we need more money. And we need more money for wraparound services for students, uh -huh. especially less advantaged, for uh -huh. mental health services, uh, which we all have to own up to now, I think, uh, and for career counseling. We know how the system works economically, but we don't tell the students. I mean, why don't we do that? They're not children. You know, you can talk to them. They can, you can tell them Santa Claus is real, but when they're 19, 18, 19 years old, I think it's fair to tell them the truth. Um, friends, the, just this is a question for everyone in the chat. Um, uh, would you mind if I publish the chat and the questions to a blog post uh, anonymized? I'll just remove all of your names. Uh, just let me know in the chat um, or DM me uh, if you have any requests because the chat box, Tony, I'll, I'll share this with you afterwards. The chat box has exploded. It's, it's huge. Uh, and I don't think we can get to all the questions in, in the time we have. So I, I want to make sure that, uh, that we can share these. Uh, Vanessa, John, Lisa, Roxanne, Mark, um, thank you. Jordan, thank you. Um, we have uh, one question that's historical and then a couple that point to the future. Uh, and the, the historical question is actually um, a, about the Truman Commission. And let me see if I can put this up uh, carefully. Um, hang on a second. This is uh, from Greg Shuckman. Uh, and I'll, I'll, let me just put this in two different boxes. You, you see what I mean? Uh, and 75 years ago, the President's Commission on Higher Education released a six-volume report entitled Higher Education for American Democracy. Given the challenges that we're seeing today to American, here's the second box, democracy, should the Biden administration dust off this report and learn how higher education can once again strengthen American democracy? So One this, of the questions this, is this a guy little bit over, over at uh, Brookings, and I'm forgetting his name, but... 
Wow. He wrote a piece, and I'm happy he didn't mention my center. Uh, but he wrote, a, I thought, a brilliant piece talking about, you know, we've been so focused on getting people jobs in education, we forgot about citizenship. It's hard to refute that, in my judgment. Um, so that, and in the meantime, the economy, in part through education, has created a society of winners and losers. And the losers are very angry. Now, it's not just because of their wage. There are some uglier issues than this, I think it's fair to say. So the, the um, um, no, we the system itself doesn't do that. Uh, any attempt to do that, uh, I mean, there are certain things that are legitimate, like service learning, uh, any kind of internship or applied learning or work-based learning is now very prized. Service learning is a substitute for that. It's not as effective as work-based learning in economic terms. Um, but the, uh, I think that there'll be, I think there'll be more of that. Oh, it doesn't show up. Uh, if you look at Build Back Better, which was kind of a, uh, it was one of the first, what was unique about it to me because uh, I see this elsewhere, is yeah. it's the new era in education reform, which basically says what we really have here is all one system. Uh, and that if we're going to help disadvantaged kids, starts in preschool. We know that. Uh, we so, Social scientists have always known that. So, uh, but policymakers know that now. So when they write stuff, if you look at the education platforms of the two parties, uh, the Democratic Party is much stronger on this because it has a big education plan. Uh -huh. But the Republicans as well. There's a general recognition uh, that systemic reform is required. So you've got this guy, Newsom, uh -huh. uh, running in California, uh, who's running on, I think his phrase is literally cradle to career. In some ways, I hope it isn't because he's going to get whacked on that. Uh -huh. But um, people call him communist and all that. So I think the um, that realization is here now. Now, education and all we all work for somebody. Uh, although I'm a professor, so that's arguable. But in the end, um, best job I ever had. So in the end, uh, the the system is compartmentalized and subdivided in. Uh, you know, it's a very difficult thing to comprehend uh, reform across a whole system. And you don't want to do it the old fashioned way. That's we're way past that. You know, um, you don't turn American education into General Motors. You don't have an education czar who runs. That, that is never going to happen. So uh, the way you do it was is with information services, support systems. It's a tough fight because uh, you're asking people to give up their advantages in many cases. Uh -huh. It's a fight that's still alive in the courts. That is, we lost uh, on the Rodriguez case in 1973. Um, the Supreme Court essentially said there's no right to education in America. Basically, that's what they said. After they said there was one in Brown v. the Board of Education. But anyway, uh, the uh, going forward, there's no help, no hope for the federal government on this. But in the states, what happened after Rodriguez was the lawyers, not a lot of them, but a bunch of them shifted to the states. And they've been suing the states. And they've had some, I, a lot of people think it's not terribly successful. I think it's successful. That is, if you end up um, uh, what it tends to argue, the cases tend to argue something that's very hard to measure, which is educational adequacy. And then the question becomes, Adequacy by itself doesn't say anything. You have to know if you're talking about adequacy, you got to say adequacy for what? Uh -huh. And the for what, increasingly, it'll have the citizenship language in there almost always. We've got this for, we've pulled this in court cases from 50 states. But uh, the adequacy stuff, it always includes the citizenship thing, but it's almost like a throwaway. And then uh, it will include uh, to make people ready for careers in a modern economy. That's where uh -huh. it bites. Because you can prove it doesn't. <laughs> so uh, my own bias is that we ought to be mounting a lot of court cases in a lot of states because the the K-12 system, uh, its claim, and there's a history to this, its current claim 
is that they're going to make people college and career ready. They don't make anybody career ready. So except for 30% of American workers at any given point in time, and only 20% of them have a good job. And they're over the age of 40 or 50. So there is a, um, I think there's a pathway here in the courts, which is something that everybody's forgotten about. So that's one way forward. Um, friends, that, that last question was uh, uh, a point at general democracy. So expanding our purview today from uh, uh, economics, but I think quite, quite rightly. Uh, now we have a burst of questions which look ahead a little uh, almost apocalyptically. Uh, so let me just put these up here. One is from our, our wonderful friend, uh, guest, and supporter, Tom Haynes, uh, who asks, what happens when the economic model that supports this system, higher ed, no longer makes sense? What's next when people say the emperor has no clothes? Uh, capitalism, I mean, after having a hell of a run since in the post-war era with notable exceptions, you know, uh -huh. Japan and Germany in the 70s and so on, uh -huh. um, recessions, uh, etc. So uh, it's still having a hell of a run. I mean, what we just saw uh, with COVID is the breakdown in supplier chains. All of that was built, and it'll be rebuilt, I feel quite sure, because uh -huh. it works. Uh, all that was built because of a technology revolution in combination with globalization in the 1980s, after the 80-81 recession. Uh, uh -huh. And uh, that will still prevail. But what is happening, I note that last week, uh, something that I used to do a lot of work in politics, and this is shocking to me, um, the, uh, the bill that we use to compensate workers dislocated by trade, trade adjustment assistance, uh -huh. uh, it expired. Now, it's always had a hard time because, but what it tells you is we don't have the votes for trade anymore on the Hill. Uh, that is, trade can be seriously challenged. That is, you can beat a trade bill. In my day, you couldn't do that. I used to lobby against them all the time. Then when I worked on the Hill, I helped write them. But the, you know, the, uh, you can now beat a trade bill. And the fact that TAA went down is very telling to me. Incidentally, as a labor lobbyist, I lobbied against training because one of the things I didn't want to say to my members or the UAW, or more so the industrial unions than my, my own members, but was uh, nobody wants training. <laughs> they want their job. And if you stand up in front of, and I've seen this and been there, uh, if you stand up of, of an audience, in front of an audience of American workers and you talk about your education and training bill, what they think you're saying to them is you're going to be fired. Yes. Uh, you, do, you do that once. Never do it again. That's why you'll notice you don't hear politicians doing that, except for training for young people. That's where the popularity is now. So I think the... Uh, I think we've come to the point, and a lot of conservative economists agree with this remarkably to me, it's just logic, that is we've come to a point in capitalism where it's going to have to change shape. That is, uh, mm -hmm. the environmental questions alone uh, are enough to force us uh, to deal with externalities, environmental externalities, anyway, from the economy. And there are a number of other issues like that. So I don't know that capitalism is going to go away. I hope it doesn't. I mean, I'm uh, a bit of a hybrid. I'm a classical liberal. I think I like strong markets and strong governments. And I think that's what we're headed for. Now, how you make strong markets, you just have to be, you, there's going to be an issue about externalities, common subject and economics classes. But it really is up now. I mean, it's up in a very uh, meaningful and obvious way. Tony, first of all, thank you for that impassioned response. Uh, we have uh, in, in the chat, people have been digging up uh, links on TAA. Uh, thank you, Eileen. Um, but also Tom Hames has a genius for asking uh, very, very deep and productive questions. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, friends, we have five minutes more, which is ridiculous uh, that we have so little time left to go. And I wanted to share a couple more questions. Um, and this is a personal one that comes from uh, our friend, Jill Yashikawa, who's at Creative Marbles. And uh, Jill asks a really good advice question. What's your advice for a Generation Zer 
nurtured with a college or bust mindset, worried about their increasing college costs and about higher ed when they don't expect to earn more than their parents? Uh, I think the only reality-based message is education is going to be key in your future. Uh, make your choices carefully. Uh, obviously, because you won't, if you're, if you're like most people, you won't choose based on which is the job, the, the, uh, uh, the field of study with makes the most money, which is uh, mm -hmm. petroleum engineering, by the way. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't, I never wanted to be a petroleum engineer. But <laughs> so the, I mean, I was a his, intellectual and cultural history major and Asian studies major in college. Wow. And then I decided I'd be an engineer, but I read a piece that was probably wrong in Newsweek a hundred years ago where they said they were laying <laughs> everybody off at NASA. So I became an economist. So I figured I'd cash in on the an economics program. And I did. But you just got to think that way. I mean, you got to figure out who you want to be. Now, part of the problem is you're not going to get much help with that. You got to figure out who you're going to be, what that means about what you want to do. Hmm. Uh, you need counseling and good information. Hmm. We're almost at the point where we have good economic information on higher ed. Uh -huh. That alone, of course, I always, uh, we publish a lot of stuff that puts numbers on this. And, you know, the worst possible thing is that somebody's making a decision based on our reports, uh, because that's not the way you should think about it. And if you do think about it that way, you're going to be sorry. At some point, you're going to be sorry. Well, first of all, thank you for the uh, for the terrific question, uh, Jill. I really appreciate that and, and the heart in that question. And Tony, thank you for that rich answer, which combines personal advice with the uh, macro structure really elegantly. Uh, we've got a question now from uh, Anne uh, Fenzi again, and uh, I'm putting this one up because I think it's a great one to end on. Um, and uh, I appreciate you asking this one, Anne. So much of this sounds bleak. I'm a pragmatist and an optimist. What's the good news? What ac what actions can we take to improve degree completion, especially for marginalized learners? That's always what I say to my daughter when she calls. What's the good news? Anyway, the uh, <laughs> so the um, the good news is, and I think you know it maybe shows my age, but. The fact that human beings are becoming so much more valuable, I mean, we could be living in a world, and we all thought we might be back in the 70s uh -huh. uh, when everybody got, you know, Mac jobs, or we all took in our, we all made our living, as people used to say, by taking in each other's laundry and all that. Uh -huh. It didn't happen. Turns out a service economy is, can be a high pay, high skill economy. And I'm one of them. We didn't think that. I didn't think that back then. Uh, not many people did. Beginning after 83, there were a bunch of economists that sort of figured this out. Um, but the, I think it is a fairly hopeful, as we are very wealthy people, uh, we can do whatever we want. The question is, what the hell do we want? And education has the power. That's what's so remarkable about it's good and bad news, as always, in my view of the world. Uh, the good news is it has the power to do the things we want it to do. That is to give opportunity universally, uh, to mm -hmm. allow people to live more fully in their time in a number of respects, part of which is being a worker or a professional, whatever you want to call it. Uh, uh, but that we have that capability. The question is, and we do know how to keep people from dropping out of college. Now, part of it is a K-12 problem. Uh -huh. uh, there's no doubt about that. But uh, And there it gets down to the old issue of uh, financing, funding uh, programs for less advantaged folks and that sort of thing. But it's not like we don't know about this stuff. We're not as... It used to be back in the day uh, when during the riots in the late 60s, early 70s, Princeton and a bunch of colleges brought in a bunch of... Uh, uh, African Americans and just dropped them on the campus. Well, most of them flunked out. Of course they did. They didn't know where they were. Uh, and so the what we've learned since then is that with supportive services and so on, we can do these things. It's not, this is not brain surgery anymore. People understand. Question is, 
does the business model in higher education, which is a very tough business model uh, and is unforgiving, um, it doesn't allow us to do those things. So, I, you know, my bias is community, free community college was a good idea because we can't get people college and career ready with K-12 education anymore. We need a couple more years. In a couple more years at the front end, these poor little beggars are going to go going to school all their lives. But the, um, I think we know how to do this. This is not brain surgery. It's the will to do it. And I think we'll do it. Frankly, I, I think people are, um, I tend to be part optimist, part pessimist, but I think both are real. I agree. Bravo for that fantastic answer, Tony. And, and thank you for that great question. Uh, friends, much as I hate to say it, we're out of time. Uh, we have we have blitzed through an hour of intense conversation and thought. Uh, Tony, this is fantastic. Is, is the best way to keep up with your work going to the CEW site and signing up for updates? Oh yeah, it's not my work. It's me and twenty two other people. All right. Well, that was That's the why it's good work, not because it's my work. <laughs> well, thank you. God help thank us you. if it was my work. Well. You've helped us. Uh, thank you so much for this wonderful hour of conversation. Thank you for your work. Sure, and it's my pleasure. We'll follow up with you. Take, Take care. care. Have a good weekend. Thank Stay you. healthy. Yes, you too. You too. Uh, don't go away, friends. Uh, I've got to point you to the next um, the next uh, couple of weeks of the forum, but let me thank you for a fantastic hour. Uh, I am going to follow this up with a blog post, um, uh, anonymizing your comments and your questions. Uh, if you want to keep talking about this, if you're really curious about how to reboot higher education, if you're interested in what Dr. Conor Valle said about the questions of our fittedness for this new economy, please use the hashtag FTTE at uh, Twitter or follow me at Brian Alexander or at Shindig Events and go to uh, follow my blog, brianalexander.org, which is where I'll post a recording of this along with some comments. Uh, if you'd like to look at the recording, or as well as the recordings of 300 plus sessions, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. Uh, if you want to look at our previous our sessions to come, rather, go to forum.futureeducation.us and you can see all of our topics ahead. And if you'd like to share with me some of your work, especially along these lines, just email me and I'll be glad to share it with the entire community. Uh, once again, thank you all for a fantastic conversation. Thank you all for contributing your thought your hopes, your keen intelligence. As um, Director Carnavalli said, have a good weekend, stay safe, everyone, and we'll see you next time online. Take care. Bye-bye.